right. Hey, good morning. It's great to see you all. Go and grab your Bible. You can turn to uh, the book of Revelation. We're going to be jumping into uh, chapter 4 ultimately here. Uh, so excited about this, uh, this message. Ties right into what we've been singing this morning, what you all have been just worshiping God, centered around really that Revelation song. How about that? Um, amazing. I mean, this is straight out of the text we're going to look at uh, today. So here's what I want to say today. Your view of God determines your response to God. Your view of God determines your response to God. Little God, little worship. Big God, big worship. And today, uh, I want you to see a a vision of God. I'm, I'm asking, I'm praying. We've already been praying. Lord, give us a redemptive kind of imagination to see what it might be like to see you face to face. Think about this. If we, could, if we could step into heaven right now and see what, what it looks like to see Jesus face to face and then to watch and see what happens when every person, every creature, every being, all of creation sees him for who he is, what happens? You might imagine. They can only worship him. That's all they do. So my mind runs this way. I want to see him. If I'm going to really worship him, and worship, of course, involves obedience and lifestyle and everything I say and everything I do, everything I think. If I'm going to worship him, I want to see him. It's why I often say, stop trying to be like him and just behold him. Now, yes, we want to be like him. But if we see him, isn't this true in your life? I know it's true in mine. When I see him, it's why every time I enter into worship, I have a simple prayer. Lord, show me again how much you love me. Remind me again when I open his word. Remind me again how much you love me. Because I've learned in my life, the more I'm captured by his love for me, the more I respond in love for him. And he loved me first. I respond. That's worship. So Lord, show us your glory was Moses' prayer. Lord, show us who you are. What if, what if we could open a portal of heaven Look in and see what do creatures do, people, what do they do, angels, everybody around the throne, what do they do when they see him? That would be legit. That's Revelation 4 and 5, okay? So that's where we're going to head here in just a minute. Let me set this up a little bit because uh, it is true. Uh, Your view of God... uh, It really determines your response to God. I think A.W. Tozer is worth quoting again. He said, what comes into our minds when we think of God is the most important thing about us. I mean, if you want to be a person that's filled with faith, filled with joy, if you want to be that person in your workplace or in your school, your family, this non-anxious presence when everybody else is freaking out, if you want to live a life of worship, it's going to start with a proper view of who God is. So, Are you tracking with me? Listen to this. It means, how do we know who he is? If you're not in his word, no wonder you forget who he is. I mean, think about your week that was. Last Monday, man, I got so stressed, I forgot who he was. Tuesday morning, I was freaking out with my kids. I forgot who he was and who I am, therefore. I was so anxious on Thursday night because I thought, oh man, my business was going south and I had to, or this person was upset with me on Friday morning. I forgot who he was. It's why we constantly must be in his word. And it's why, y'all listen, this gathering is so critical in your life. What did we just do? Remember, remember, remember. Because we're so prone to forget. We've got to keep coming back to his word, keep coming together, reminding each other. And that's what the church is. Yo, listen, you know how much he loves you, right? I forgot. He loves you so much. Let me love on you and show you how much he loves you. That's what the body of Christ is all about. So we began this series last week and we said that revelation, it's revelation, not revelations. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what it is. As much as anything, it's a vision of who Christ is. Exalted and glorified, and it's apocalyptic writing. So that means it has this miraculous quality of, of being written to real people at a real time who are being oppressed and, and, and persecuted. And, and yet, 
through every era of church history and even on into the future, it still has this miraculous application along the way. We said last week, if uh, the church is a damsel in distress, uh, awaiting a hero to come and rescue us, her, from the tower, today we're going to see the hero shows up and the story changes completely. The hero is revealed. He makes his entrance into the storyline and everything changes. So you might know that Revelation is a drama. Or maybe you don't know this. It's played out in three, three locations. Uh, the church, the world, and heaven. If all you see is a church in the world, a church that is what it is and not what it could be, and if you see the world, what it is and what it's not, and that's all you see, that's despairing. That's all that John sees up to this point. And he sees the letters to the churches, which I think seven represents the whole holistic view of the church and challenges in every era and every church. I think it's a picture of the church. It's not encouraging, right? If you, if you know anything about those letters. He is distressed. He's in despair and, and he's wondering what is going to happen. And he's trying to encourage, I say that, the Lord is showing him what to say and what to write. He's trying to encourage the people who are oppressed and discouraged. And many of us here today, all we see is the world in front of us and we are distressed. Or maybe we even look at the church and we are despairing. What if we could see, again, what's happening in heaven? And that's what happens in chapter 4 and 5. And it's written so that we'll be encouraged. And my prayer is that you will never be the same again. So, the hero to the rescue, spoiler alert, he is the lamb who was slain. That's who the hero is. So look, uh, chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. All right, beginning with verse 1. I'm going to walk us through. I'm going to let the text speak for itself today. And after this, this, uh, after those seven letters to the churches, um, he says, I, I looked up and behold, a door. This is amazing. Good hang out here all morning. A door standing open in heaven. There's a door open in heaven. I mean, it's formally shut. Now it's open. And the first voice, which you heard in chapter 1, verse 11, he said that, that sounded like a trumpet. Okay, now, this is symbolic language. So, like, like, did he sound like a trumpet? Did he, hey, come in here. Um, no, sounded like a trumpet. What's this mean? I'm guessing very clear, very loud. And note this too. Numbers in Revelation are not numbers. They represent something else. Now, yes, they attach to other numbers, as we'll see. But this is, this is not to be taken literally. And when we do this, we get crazy. I grew up as a kid. I was taught, like, well, you know, there's locusts. There's locusts. That's like, oh, those are helicopters. And I'm like, well, you, you, you're a grown-up. You, I guess you know what you're talking about. That's nuts. And then I grow up, and I start to study, and I go, that's nuts. It's why you're not going to see us drawing a big chart up here and telling you this is all about the last seven years of, of, of life on the planet as we know it. That is not what the book of Revelation is about. It's written, yes, it's apocalyptic, but it's written to real people in real time and it's written for us even now. And so today we're going to see not what's happened in the future. We're looking at what's happening now and a celebration of what's already happened in the past. That's what we're going to see here. So look at what he sees. At once I was in the spirit. And behold, a throne. First thing he sees in heaven is a throne. A throne dominates everything. At the center of heaven is a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. There's someone seated on this throne. And he, he who sat there was, had the appearance of jasper. That's a clear, kind of like diamond, diamonds. And, and carnelian, this is uh, like a red ruby. Uh, so God lives in brilliant light, the scripture tells us. And, and, and around the throne was a rainbow. Now watch this. This is amazing. Around, around it was a rainbow. had the appearance of, of an emerald. So, so there's a rainbow. This is not a double rainbow. That's awesome enough. This is like a rainbow all the way around. I mean, we can hardly imagine this, but it's like this, this laser show. I mean, there's lights, probably colors we've never seen before is what I'm guessing. And it's just amazing. And seated on the thrones were 24 elders Okay, we'll, we'll talk about that in a sec. Clothed in white garments. They're holy ones, made holy, by the way. Chapter 3, verse 5. And they're golden crowns on their heads. Verse, verse 10 out of chapter 
too. These crowns, you're given some kind of honor. These elders are crowned. I believe it's the faithful ones who've remained faithful. That would be us or anyone who's gone before us. And they are crowned. I believe the 24 elders, what's 24? 24, 12 and 12. I think we've got the, those who represent the, the, the 12 sons of Jacob. So the 12 tribes of Israel, think all the Old Testament, right? people of God. And then you've got the 12 apostles in the New Testament representing all the people in the New Testament. You have all of the people of God who are there worshiping before this one who's seated on the throne. So they represent all of us. If you wonder what what's happening in heaven, what, what's going on? I think a lot's happening in heaven, but this is, this is the main thing that's happening. Anyone who's gone before us, and this is not, by the way, the new heaven and new earth. That's coming, but this is, this is what's happening. The seven spirit, look at this. It says then burning, there's a throne around the throne. No, listen, before, the, before we get there, verse five. Megan sang about it earlier. From the throne came flashes of lightning. I mean, so if we thought, let's go up and hug, the, let's go chill, let's, let's hang out. No, watch this. He, he, he's, he's, it's, it's uh, like uh, Chronicles of Narnia. I love that line, Miss Beaver, Mr. Beaver. It's, it's, uh, it's safe. No, he's not safe. But he's good. But he's not safe. Look at this. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumbling the peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. We noted last week, seven, again, number representing wholeness, completeness, the complete spirit of God. I believe this is the Holy Spirit. Watch this. The the throne, God seated on the throne, the spirit of God surrounding the throne. And we're going to see here in a minute, Jesus, this is Trinitarian worship. God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit present right in front of these people, right in front of these creatures. Look at what happens. It, It goes on. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. So this is so we got a sea now separating us from the throne. Where else do we see this? We got a sea separating the work of God, the presence of God. There's this is like the Red Sea. What we need is a new Exodus. We need a new, we need someone that can bridge the gap here. There's a distance between us, there's a separation between us. And then it says, and around the throne, on each side of the throne are four living creatures. Now, watch this. A lot of people want to describe all kinds of futuristic things or things going on. You know, Hitler is the Antichrist. You know, every president that's ever come is the Antichrist. No, no, probably not. Okay. Uh, yeah, Hitler was Antichrist, right? Anyone who is, comes against Christ is Antichrist. But watch this. It says here the four living creatures. Here, here's what I'm going to say. The, the, these creatures, they're cherubim. Cherubim, a lot of what we see in the, in the book of Revelation... Don't miss this. John is drawing from the Old Testament. So a lot of times like, what is this? Well, look at the Old Testament. Look at other apocalyptic literature. We see it in Daniel. We see it in Ezekiel. These are cherubim, which were creatures that had different like, a, like you know, faces, a head. Look at what it says. It says they're creatures full of eyes in, in front. Now, this sounds kind of, kind of wild and crazy. The second, it is wild and crazy. The second living creature... Um, okay, the first one was a lion. The second was an ox. The, the third was like the, had the face of a man. And the fourth creature was like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them had six wings and full of eyes all around them. And, and day and night, they would never cease to praise him. I believe these creatures represent all of creation. I mean, when you think about animals that, that, that live and, and fly and strong and, and, and powerful, and then you got a man in the midst of it all. These, these are, you could just say, all living creatures on the planet who see him, who are there in front of him, day and night, meaning continually. They say this, look at this triple holies. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. This is, these are superlatives in the Hebrew. Holy, holy, holy. This is Trinitarian praise. Holy, holy, holy. If you want to know what happens when someone comes face to face with God Almighty, all they do is worship him. That's all we can do when we see him. Lord, show us your glory. Show me more of that because I want to be worshiping you when I leave this place this afternoon. I want to worship you in the morning. Show me more of who you are. It's why I'm in his word every morning, why you should be in his word every day. Lord, remind me of who you are and get me back among God's people as quickly as possible. Because there I'm reminded of who he is through the way they love me. Point me to Jesus, the way we live together and love one another. 
It's why we should never miss the gathering of God's people. Unless you're worshiping 24-7 like this and you, you worship Him with every area of your life. And even there, come, help the rest of us do that, right? And so look at what it says here. Uh, you're worthy, O oh Lord. You are worthy, O oh Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things. And by your will they existed and were created. Okay, this has been called the creation song. Now, it says singing, but, you know, perhaps singing. But it's creation that is being, he's being praised as the creator. Okay, now, we're going to turn to chapter 5. All of this to set us up for chapter 5. And, and chapter 5 helps us, it helps us answer a, a couple of questions. The first key question, two key questions, and then one to challenge as we close. Why do we worship him? The second question is how do we worship him? It answers both of these here, okay? So look at, look at chapter 1, I mean chapter 5, verse 1. And then I saw in the right hand, so is this literally a hand, like a giant Monty Python hand coming down? It? No, no, this is a place of authority and power. This is sovereignty of God. In his hand, a scroll. He's seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on back. So there's on the front and the back, which is really unusual, by the way, for scrolls. But it means there, there's, there's, there's nothing to be added. It's complete. It's full. Sealed with seven seals. Now, back in the day in, in the Roman world, um, a, 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 a scroll would be sealed. You often would see this with, think, um, think like a last will and testament. Okay, like, like a, you need an executor to open that thing. Or think um, a deed of purchase. And once it's broken, then the contents are, are revealed. All that's there is, is unleashed, you know, uh, given out, poured out. And so it has seven seals. So what would that mean? Completely sealed. There's no way to open this thing. And, and then this, it's sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals, as we proclaimed, saying earlier. And no one, no one in heaven and earth or under there, that is to say, nobody living, nobody dead was able to open the scroll or to look into it. Nobody can see the contents. And then he says in verse 4, I began to weep loudly because no one was able to open the scroll. So let's think about this scroll. What is the scroll and why is John weeping? Well, this, this is not the Lamb's book of life. We'll see that later on in Revelation 20. Anyone whose name is written in the Lamb's book of life will be saved. Will have eternal life before him. This is not the scroll. That's a scroll about the future. This scroll is about the past. This scroll is about what has already happened, things that have already taken place. I would say it this way, simply put, you can see it there on the screen. The scroll is the fullness of God's plan of judgment, redemption, and inheritance. That's what it is. We see it in prophetic literature. If I had time, I go to Daniel 7. There's thrones were placed. The Ancient of Days is seated on the throne. There's this court set in judgment, and they open these books in Ezekiel 2. Uh, even says to eat the scroll uh, that's going to come around again here in Revelation. Written on the front and back, it says in Ezekiel, words of lamentations and woe. Words of judgment. Isaiah 29, we see the same. It's sealed. He cannot open it. I believe it's referring to the same seal, sealed scroll. The judgment of God, the purposes of God. Again, this is like a deed of purchase. It's a sealed document and, and, and it's the, 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 the contents of it will not be revealed, will not be dispensed, will not be unleashed until the executor of the state shows up. Jesus is our executor of our eternal estate. And he is the only one who can open it. But not yet. John doesn't know this. And so he weeps because history will not be judged. Wrong will not be made right. There will be no justice. There's no redemption. There's no hope. There's no future inheritance. I'm reminded of Paul who said, if this is not true, if the crucifixion, the resurrection, he said, didn't happen, we are the most all people to be pitied. And this is where John is. This is arguably the saddest moment in all of Scripture. Until we read the next verse. Because watch this, enter the hero into the storyline. He's introduced, verse 5, and one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Stop crying. Behold, look, the Lamb 
of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, a clear reference to the Messiah, if you've been walking with us through the scriptures, in Genesis, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. There is one who can open the scroll. And it's the, it's the, it's the Lion of Judah. He's part of the human tribe. He, he, is, he is among God's people. He's the root of David. He comes from the messianic line. Jesus is the judge. Jesus is the judge. What does redemption mean? Listen, if, if, it, if there is no justice in this world, what have you been rescued from if it's not the judgment of God against wicked people and against all wickedness and against your sin? What have you been saved from if it's not from your own sin, the judgment of God coming upon all sin? Why would you turn to Christ if you're not under the judgment of God and His holiness and His righteousness, His justice? See, the judge, the Lion of Judah, has come and He alone can save us. You can bow down now or you can bow down then. You will bow down to Him. When you see Him, you will bow down to Him. It's why Paul says, every knee will bow. And every tongue will see who he is. So friends, I'm begging you. Now is the time to worship him. Now and yes, five minutes from now. Later today, all that we have, watch where this goes. John hears that it's a lion. Then he sees that it's a lamb. Watch this. In between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing. As though it had been slain with seven horns. Okay, all authority, seven eyes, all power. He's omniscient and he's omnipotent. He's omnipotent, which are the seven spirits of God, the Holy Spirit sent out into all the earth. So which is he? Is he a lion or a lamb? I think of a, like a hologram on your credit card. You, you see one of those? It's like, he's a lion. He's a lamb. Wait, he's a lion. He's a lion. He's a lion and a lamb. He's a lion and a lamb. And John is seeing this at the same time. Is he a lion or a lamb? And a lot of people think, well, you know, I've heard people look at Revelation. Well, he's got a tattoo on his thigh and he's coming with a sword in his mouth. He's coming to kick butt is what he's going to do. I said butt in a sermon. He's coming to kick booty and he's coming and he's mad. I mean, it's like people say, you know, Jesus is the kind and gentle Savior. But in Revelation, he's coming and he's taking names and he's... No! Watch this. He's the lion, but then he sees how is he going to accomplish all this? What does he do with all of his authority? He's a little lamb is the language. And he is, has been slain. How do we know this? His throat has been slit, cut. He is, he's died, but now he's alive. In fact, he's overcome something, it says. He's victorious over something. This little lamb is the way that God brings his justice and his judgment and his love and his mercy all at one time. This is what we see on the cross. We see the wrath of God coming to us that is due us. And we see his grace and his mercy. They collide on the cross and redemption is made possible for us. And here we see the Lamb of God, who is the Lion of Judah. He triumphs over all things. He's Aslan, if you know what I'm talking about, who reigns and is all-powerful, and yet he dies, and then he's raised again. Your view of God, I'll say it again, determines your response to God. Are you following me here? Your view of Him determines how you worship Him. To the degree that you have a proper view of Him, you will worship Him. And so I say it this way. I think the greatest sin in our day is a little view of God. Look, look at how every creature responds to him. They can't stop praising him. That's all they can do. They bow down and throw their crowns at his feet. I've said it before. Listen, if Jesus doesn't do another thing for you for the rest of your life, if from this day on, Your life gets worse and worse and worse. And you go, I mean, southbound gravitational pull towards all things that are worse and worse day after day until the day you die. He's already done enough for you to praise him all of your life and through all of eternity. Amen? That's where you're supposed to say amen. 
Because we're to worship him regardless of what comes our way because of who he is and what he's done. Why do we worship him? He is worthy. Answer the question for me. Why do we worship him? He is worthy. How do we worship him? I'll close with this. We proclaim who he is. Look at what they do. Look at verse 9. And they sang a new song. See, if the former song was about creation, of course he's the creator. I mean, it's a simple law and effect. We're here. We were created by someone. You can't get something from nothing. You can't get living matter from non-living matter. Of course he's the creator. Now this thing turns and it's, extre- it's, it's explicitly Christocentric. Now it's about the cross. Now it's about the resurrection. Look at this. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open the seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God whom every, from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have been made, you were made, made them, I'm sorry, made them a kingdom and priest to our God. And they shall reign on the earth. What does this mean? We're priests. What does this mean? We do priestly things. We're mediators. We're intermediaries between, between people who don't know God and, and those of us who do know God. We bridge the gap for them. We point them to God in everything that we do. Listen, friends, some of you here today need to sing a new song. You've been singing an old song. And you need to sing a new song with your life. And this is a song that is centered on the one that we've been worshiping, singing about, the one that we will see face to face someday. You know, so much has been made over the past couple of weeks about Kanye. Kanye got saved. Kanye got an album. It's a Christian album. It's amazing. Kanye, he, he says, he, he speaks more explicitly about the gospel than a lot of pastors I know in this album. People are like, I can't believe Kanye got saved. I can't believe you got saved. I mean, I can't believe I got saved. Listen, if you're not the most sinful person that you know, you don't know yourself very well. He's come to rescue us. So what do we do? How do we worship him? How do we worship him? We give all to him. We give all to him. Every word, every thought, every, every dollar, everything we have, every way I spend my money, every penny I spend, I give all to him. We give all to him because look at what it says. Worthy, verse 12, worthy is the lamb who was slain. To receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. What does it mean to give him these things? Stop taking the power as your own. Relying on your own power. Jeff, how would I know? Tell me about your prayer life. That's how I know. How do I give all wealth to him? Show me your checkbook. Show me your, your bank account. Are you generous with what you have? Do you share? Are you a giver? What about wisdom? Well, you know, I'm pretty whipping smart. I mean, I've got a degree. I got a college degree. You have n- Sorry. He's the one. Rely on him. Our powers, our capability, our might, our talents, we turn back to him. Yo, this week I did something I've never done before. So Lady Gaga posted, fame is prison. And admittedly, this is Jesus juke, but I came back to her. I thought I'd offer something. <laughs> and I just said, I just said, we weren't meant to be famous. Christ alone. Praise him. Friends, stop trying to be famous in your little world. Think about it. Every person who's ever been famous. The most famous people in America have self-destructed. We think Marilyn Monroe. Elvis, Michael Jackson, Prince, on and on. We can't handle power. We can't handle wealth. Stop trying to be famous and make him famous. In everything you do, bring glory to him. Bring blessing, which is the word eulogy. It means to speak well of or to speak about him this week. Use the name Jesus in your, in your language and in your sentences and things you talk about. Oswald Chambers is the one who said, worship is giving back to God the very best that he's given to us. That's worship. So Revelation 5.13, every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, 
be blessing and honor and glory and might. So there's only one question that matters as we head out. Will you worship him? Will you worship him? Friends, it might look like evil is winning, but it's not. It may look like judgment will not come, but it's coming. Don't weep. Instead, rejoice. Psalm 30 says, you turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. That my heart may sing of your praises and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will praise you forever. So let's say it together. Revelation 5, 12. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Praise be to our God. Let's worship Him. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank You for Your Word today and this vision of how good You are. And Lord, I pray that each of us will bow down before You and worship You with our lives. I pray for those who are here. Friend, if you are here and you have not received Christ or you don't know, if you know Him and you've not received His grace, what He's done for you by faith, I want you to stay afterwards and talk to us. I'd love to talk to you. Pray with you. You need to give Him your life. You're going to worship Him. But then it'll be too late. It it is true. All roads lead to God. But only those who've been saved by the blood of the Lamb will have eternal life with Him. Have you received Him? Receive Him now. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Make me the person You've created me to be. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Lord, we love you. We give you our lives as an act of worship. It's the only right, logical, spiritual thing to do. You are worthy. In your name we pray.